among all your chairs, there's a little booklet uh, that basically summarises uh, the findings from the project. Um, and uh, along with that, we also have just recently included uh, another little uh, sheet that's also in the booklet, a uh, little insert which has some case studies of the year 60 sites in the Vertican. And on the back of that sheet, there is some QR codes. Uh, if you want to obtain the uh, full final report, uh, you can just use a QR code and we'll take us to that report. So as you can see from the uh, first slide, there's been a lot of different organisations involved in um, EF60. Um, it's um, yeah, in the final stage and uh, we've still got some pretty good results, I think. Just a bit of background. So the project was initiated in 2016 and uh, covers all the regions of the Great Barrier Reef catchment. Uh, it was funded uh, by the Australian and Queensland governments through Reef Trust Pool. Uh, and Kane Growers uh, was the, uh, the project manager. So Kane Growers uh, appointed SRA and DAF uh, to do the research. And um, we also obviously got uh, a lot of assistance from the various productivity services uh, and cane growers uh, across the regions. And we also had a technical working group uh, that was established. Uh, the members are from SRA, uh, CSIRO, DES, um, the federal government, uh, and um, basically just to oversee the, the science of the work being conducted. So our basic aim was to determine if enhanced efficiency fertilisers can improve uh, nitrogen use efficiency, decrease losses, whilst maintaining productivity and profitability. So in the wet tropics, uh, and this is where I'm based, we have 35 sites uh, from as far north as the Lower Daintree uh, down to Ingham. Burdekin here, uh, we had 21 sites over the period of the project. Obviously, um, some in the Delta, some in the Briar. We had some in the uh, Mackay Wet Sundays region. Uh, we had 12 sites in total, and then some uh, under the. Can I just jump in and say here that the backdrop to this is that when this surf started, the general sentiment, well, that I picked up when I went to Chile, was that some of these didn't have that much of a production impact, and there was just an extra cost involved. So this is kind of the the ex, this is kind of the, the, the problem that Julian and, and, and the team have had to try and solve and to see what kind of results we're going to uh, come, up, come up with. So the main treatments applied or used uh, in the project, we used um, control release fertilisers, uh, which basically release and slowly through a polymer coating, so a physical barrier. And then we also used uh, nitrif nitrification inhibitors. The common one is uh, DMPP, which most of you probably know as NTEP. Uh, DMPP uh, is basically just used to uh, um, stabilise urea uh, or in, in the ammonium form. Uh, so the trial designs, so we used, um, across all the regions, we used the standard strip trials uh, that farmers are quite familiar with. Uh, we had our We've got uh, four main treatments. So we have the industry standard, uh, which is six easy steps. Uh, with, uh, well, we just applied six, urea, six easy steps rate as our first and uh, main treatment. And then we, uh, we applied 20% less nitrogen uh, with urea. And then we uh, incorporated our first um, EEF. You know, this uh, EEF, which was, um, one third DMPP and two thirds control of lease uh, blend is basically not a commercial product. It's a, um, or I would like to term it as an experimental product. Uh, we felt that that product um, would have, a, I suppose, a better release pattern than any sort of commercially available product. The only issue with this product, um, which was incorporated across all sites, uh, is that it's um, horribly expensive. And so I guess we're probably going to be focusing in mainly on this one and this one today, but just hold on to your seats because that, these two will provide some, I guess, interesting insights as we go along. Then our first treatment, 
so this was essentially another EF uh, applied at 20% less. Uh, and it was something that um, we gave the girls an option of to try a different, well, a different type of EF on their farm, uh, something that they were interested in and thought that may work well on their property. Most of the growers either chose uh, Entec, the Entec B, or um, utilised another product which was a control release uh, blended with urea. Because um, control releases are quite expensive, there are commercial products out there sold by different resellers uh, where they blend uh, a control release um, at a ratio of 20% control release with 80% urea, which brings it down to a sort of, I suppose, a commercially commercially viable product. Um, and these, these sort of, this treatment for was we sort of termed as wild cars. And then we also had in all our strip trials, we had some little areas where we didn't apply any in, and they were just looking at um, annually calculations. I think the involvement of growers in, in working with you guys on this is a bit of a testament to the collaboration involved in the project. You saw all the big organisations involved in partnering in this project. So there's a lot of people involved, but then also the growers working closely with the building and others, it's really good. So as I said before, typical strip trial design, sites varied from four to eight hectares. Uh, we had um, normally uh, four to five treatments replicated uh, three times, and all our harvest data and um, so the yield data and our CCs data was from the mill. Yeah, so um, fertilizer crops. I said I can talk like Matty. No. Um, Fertilizer costs were calculated from the average prices in the uh, four years of the project. And so urea was back then uh, $643 a tonne. Um, DMPP, where NTEC was $779 a tonne, which was, you know, let's say $130, $140 more than urea. Uh, Nitrogen or Entrenched had a similar cost to DMPP. And uh, there was five different types of control release fertilizer used in the project. So they were more expensive as um, Julian has mentioned, and then about at that time when we were in the 643 a tonne, these ranged from about $1,300 to $1,700 a tonne. And the table shows here the average end cost of each fertilizer treatment um, varied between regions. And looking at the burdock and, and comparing each treatment to urea at 60 steps. Um, you can see that the lower rate of urea, which was 20% less than 60 steps, that costed about $60 a hectare less. And the VMP or controlled release with 20% less than 60 steps rates of N, that cost about $140 more. Um, both wildcard treatments had similar costs per hectare to urea at 60 steps, with DMPP minus 20% of N costing uh, Ten dollars per hectare less on average, um, but you can see that, that generally speaking, the uh, wild cards are on on the path at this point in time with the urea crops. Now I'm waiting for a question from the audience. Is the urea more expensive now? <laughs> it definitely is. The urea is much more expensive now. How much more expensive is it? So let's call it $1,700 a ton for the sake of this analysis, which when we look at these costs, um, today it would cost about $91 a hectare more than some of these costs here. So bear that in mind when we get to some later results. I'm not sure if those figures that I'm using are basic based on the price differential rate remaining the same. So they've all shifted up. But then if the price differential is the same, then it's about $90 a hectare. What I understand about Antec is the application cost, so it's around the world's actually a dollars a ton now. So the portion of the total cost, it will actually be less in the urea based cost. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we haven't gone into that level of detail, I don't think, but we have kind of explored in the final stage is a bit of a rough exploration of what, what's might, what this might look like with the increase in end prices in general. 
Um, so when measuring grower profitability, we need to account for all factors um, that influence it and influence grower revenue. Um, so we're, we'll be talking in a moment about how yield or CCS differed between the treatments, um, as well as fertilizer costs and harvesting costs and levies. Now you can see that this type of analysis compared to the previous presentation is a fairly basic economic analysis. We're just taking out those key costs that change due to the different fertilizer rates. We're not doing like a full gross margin where we account for all different costs. But anyway, the point is that we then would calculate revenue based on the CCS and the yield and the harvesting costs, etc. Um, and it was calculated for each treatment and then used to compare profitability. So when I talk profitability today, I'm talking about in terms of net revenues. Um, and obviously the use rather than CCS, um, because that's what growers are actually paid on. And uh, we calculate it for each plot so that we can do whatever statistical analysis that Julian is doing. So Julian's now going to jump into some of the other things. Yeah, so just before I show some of the results, when we started the analysis of all the data, I mean, there was a heap of data from this work over a number of years. So we, um, we started just looking on a site-by-site -site basis um, and then we weren't really seeing anything. Uh, we looked on a, a local basis, so we looked at the vertical as a whole, gathered all the information here to analyse. Again, we didn't see anything. And then we had to expand our analysis and look at all sites, all regions, and analyse the data. And then we basically looked at, um, broke it down into three main um, analysis. So the first analysis was uh, all sites where growers had um, used or utilised DMPP as their wild card. And then the second one was all sites where control release fertilizers were applied as their wild card. And then we looked at all sites across all regions and, and analyzed and looked at um, all wild cards at 20% less. So this, this first slide just shows this, the outcomes for Tanta Cane and CCS for all sites with uh, NTEC treated urea. So in this analysis, we had 25 sites from across all the regions uh, with 59 harvested data uh, captured over three years. So we can see the, um, in this first little um, figure, we can see that this is uh, yield, cane yield. Our first column is urea at six easy steps. Uh, then we on to urea at 20% less. Our experimental blend, DMP, PCRF at 20% less. And then our DMP, or intake at 20% less. So this, this analysis, we can see that um, the letters are saying that there is no significant difference across any of the treatments. However, we can see there that the lower rate of urea looks like it's a bit less, uh, but the stats are saying that it's not different. But if we look at the p-value, it's very close to being significant. Uh, in, when we looked at the um, CCS for all those sites, across all those sites, um, um, well, those three years and uh, 59 harvests, we can see that the urea at six easy steps uh, had a significantly lower uh, CCS than all the other treatments. In terms of the net revenue, just look at it. If you just imagine that tons of cane per hectare figure, and that's what we had to go with, I think in the previous slide, you if you just see this, which rate would you pick? You go with the, the higher rate if you're really sure. But now we're going to take a look at the figure in terms of the net revenue. For the grower, it's not so straightforward, is it? The six easy steps is down here, uh, is, is up here, and you've got that more expensive uh, blend of enhanced efficiency fertilizers is markedly different. So I'll comment on the sugar first as I'm supposed to. Um, follow the notes that Matt gave you. Sugar yield was similar between the treatments. Um, but in terms of net revenue, um, this uh, DNPT and control release fertilizer minus 20%, that generated lower net revenue than all the other treatments. So it's about $112 a hectare lower than the standard kind of urea 60 set one. Um, now the urea. The, the lower rate of the urea, the minus 20% N, 
That actually delivered them higher net revenue than the new reader by about $60 a hectare. And the DMPP, uh, less 20%, that produced similar net revenue to both your rear treatments. So suddenly we have a, 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 a bit of an interest in can you actually maintain um, your profitability while incorporating some of these more expensive products. Um, now, sugar yield, um, I'll let, I'll comment on control at least fertilizer in a moment. So, in regards to sugar, um, across all the different treatments, again, in this case, uh, there was no, the, the stats are saying that there's no significant difference. A little bit of difference for the lower rate of urea, but, um, you yeah, know, no difference. The other thing that we looked at was NUE uh, and post harvest soil land. So with all those sites across all the regions, a team of us, we went through and uh, into every strip and we took out samples and processed those samples, as you can see in those pictures, that picture, um, and looked at the accumulation in, in the crop. We were then able to compare across treatments and sites the amount of uh, N captured by the crop and then uh, we also post harvest. We went back through and again in every strip and uh, took soil samples from the top 20 centimetres of the soil profile and looked at the amount of N remaining and again compared it. So when we looked at the N tech uh, versus urea at six easy steps, uh, we could see that it was, uh, we we're getting more cane per kilogram of applied N uh, in the N tech treatment. There was no difference in the crop and content between um, between the two. So even though we were applied, we had 20% less in going on with the DMPP treatment, uh, there was no difference in amount of in uptake. And we didn't see any difference in uh, the amount of post sale soil in across the treatments. So this slide just shows us the outcomes for uh, tons of cane and CCS for all sites where we've had the control release blended with urea at that 20% uh, CRM 80% urea ratio. Uh, so we had, again, we had about 25 sites uh, with 54 harvests over three years. And in this case, when we looked at the yield outcomes, we can see that the urea at six easy steps treatment uh, yield is significantly better than the lower rate of urea, a bit over two and a half times better than this lower rate of urea. However, uh, both EEFs uh, performed equally as well as urea applied at the six easy steps rate. For these sites, um, we didn't detect any difference in the CCS, so all the same across all the treatments. So it's early exploration of which one would you pick. Now it's not just bigger in terms of the average, it's actually bigger in terms of the being statistically significantly different. Statistically significantly different. Um, now, if I look at the economics, it becomes even more critical. What is the net revenue that you're showing them? And you can see that um, after you account for sugar and you account for those harvesting costs, um, you can see that the, there's not much of a statistically significant difference between the wild cut and the urea at six easy steps. Now, bear in mind, this was at those past prices. And if we did include that extra $90 a hectare that I talked about earlier for an increase in end costs, roughly speaking, then this wild cut would actually be probably up there and doing better. Maybe not statistically significantly different, but doing better than the urea statistics sets rate. Um, because right now there's only a twenty dollar difference, less than a twenty dollar difference between this one and this one. So you add ninety dollars on top, and you'll get a bit of a more market difference um, because of the package got a low amount of energy treatment. Um, so just gonna jump into my previous note. So sugar yield. Um, for controlled release fertilizer, uh, both urea with the lower N rate and the wild card with the lower N rate, um, they produce less sugar than urea 60 steps. Um, and the 
uh, controlled release fertilizer minus 20 percent had similar sugar to urea 60 steps. Um, now, in terms of net revenue, the two treatments and the 20 percent wall card um, controlled release fertilizer had similar net revenue. Um, and the uh, DMBP or CRF minus 20 percent. It generated lower net revenue than all the other treatments between $156 and $180 per hectare lower. Um, now, but as Julian just mentioned, um, the urea had a little less and had a lower cane yield. And so if we take off the grower hat and we put on the miller hat, um, this would actually reduce mill revenue. So including both sugar and molasses revenue, Milk revenue would decrease by about $60 a hectare, and that's assuming transported milling costs about $10 a tonne. That's just a rough approximate figure. Um, and in that case, net, net milk revenue would actually be $35 a hectare level. Um, so you got milk revenue, then you got net milk revenue, and we're saying that the mill would be about $35 per hectare lower um, when you have that urea below it. And, um, Factoring in below its tonnage. Am I making sense? Are we following? <laughs> so, when we um, look at the annual and post harvest soil in uh, for the CRF blended with urea, we can see that there's, when we looked across all the different treatments, we see there's no difference in uh, crop end content between uh, CRF compared to urea. Uh, and, and again, no difference in uh, post harvest soil in the top 20 centimetres. So, we looked at the two most common products uh, utilised in the, uh, the trials uh, individually. So, then we thought, well, uh, we'll look at all sites across all regions, we'll combine all the data uh, where wild cards were applied at 20% less analysed and see if anything else popped up in that analysis. So we had 54 sites um, in this analysis, which with 128 harvests, data captured over three years, and we had some interesting things come out. So when we looked at um, fertiliser application timing, uh, rainfall and soil types, and in regards to soil types, we just broke them down into sand, lime and clay, um, purely because of the complexity of the analysis. We found that um, in late season fertiliser applications, in high rainfall conditions, there's a bit going on. Not so much going on in um, low, low rainfall conditions and medium rainfall conditions, but there seemed to be a bit of action in this high rainfall periods in sand, lime and clay soils. So if we look at the outcomes for uh, in sandy soils, we can see that the two EEFs both appear to perform quite well, although the stats are saying that they're not significant different. The problem with this analysis here, or well, the limitation I suppose with that analysis is that we just didn't have a big data set for sandy soils, unfortunately. I think if we'd had a few more sites this would have become significant, but we're just limited on very sandy soils. However, with loamy and clay soils, we have a lot more sites, a lot more data. And we can see that um, in the loam and clay soils, that the urea in both cases performs significantly better than the lower rate urea. However, the EEFs, both the EEFs, perform equally as well as urea. <laughs> We also did a stats analysis from that point of view, and that is analysed the, the impact of different variables, which also found rainfall to be a, a key influence. Um, it didn't have much influence on the overall story, though, for the um, DNBP and CRF blends of the one third, two third blend. That's that expensive treatment. So it's still delivering a lower profitability in all rainfall conditions because of that higher cost. Um, and it, but it's even towards the performance of the year urea with the lower end rate, the lower the 20% less. So it, it actually obtained higher profitability than the other treatments in a low rainfall. So we're talking at those costs about 
So the standard costings of when the trial took place, it's about $64 per hectare bedrock than your ESX easy steps. So right at the beginning of the presentation that we're, we're interested primarily in that six easy steps versus um, the enhanced efficiency fertilizers. But it's actually interesting to have this urea one at six easy steps, but 20% less um, because it did highlight uh, some, some in improved performance with the lower, rain, lower rainfall. Um, however, the wild card with 20% uh, less uh, and it had a similar profitability to urea 60 steps in all rainfall conditions and it appeared to perform particularly well on my rainfall situations even though um, that wasn't a statistically significant difference. Um, so the net revenue was also influenced by soil type. Here's my next set of slides. Thanks, Jordan. Um, key findings were that the uh, BNTP and the CRF minus 20% treatment generated lower profitability than at least one urea treatment in nearly all combinations um, except four. Um, and that, that's including in sand or high rainfall or mid and late season. And also, the wildcard minus 20% treatment maintained profitability with urea 60 steps in every situation. And it appeared to perform particularly well in sandy soil. Um, or at quite late in the season or in high rainfall conditions. So I'll let, I guess, Julian comment on what that means in terms of growing decision making. But it's, it's, I think a key finding of this is that there's opportunities to reduce, reduce air and still main, uh, maintain uh, profitability. That's one of the key findings. So, uh, apart from the yield data, we also uh, had six sites, uh, four in the wet tropics and two in the Birmingham, where we looked at water quality. Um, and I've got up here some um, results for our leaching data. So, at the um, basically in our six sites, uh, at each of those six sites, we had 24 of these ceramic balls, four water samplers buried at one metre below the, the road, Kane Road. Um, and those devices, so we basically had some water, uh, which was carrying DIN, moved through the profile. It was essentially extracting that water as it moved past, basically past most of the root zone, and deliver it to the bottles at the surface. And then uh, we come along, we grab the samples and analyse it. So we had these in all the treatments, and we might we started monitoring uh, basically once, well, in this region, obviously, once the irrigation kicked in. And in the wet tropics, we're on basis basically with the rainfall. We had to wait until the profile wet it up uh, to trans start transporting them through the profile. So the figure, it shows us the outcome of all that sampling over the three years uh, from the sites in the Burdington and wet tropics. Uh, and we can see that obviously DIN. So it's obviously this, this figure is presenting dim concentration. Uh, and we can see that for the urea at six easy steps treatment, uh, in both cases, but in the verdict and wet tropics, was significantly uh, higher concentrations of dim than all other treatments. Um, we can, in the verdict, uh, there was no difference between the lower rate of urea treatments and the EDFs. However, in the wet tropics, we did see that um, the, uh, both the ES were slightly higher than the lower rate of urea, which was quite interesting. I'm not sure why. But um, so yeah, so this data set here um, is based on about 3,000 odd samples. So it's fairly, um, fairly uh, robust. And um, I suppose it gives us, although it's not kilo calculated as kilos, um, because we didn't have lysimeters in the in the ground, that just gives us, a, I suppose, a bit of an insight to what's happening across our treatments. So the key messages out of this work, essentially, uh, applying urea at twenty percent less, uh, we can see, you know, we lose cane yield across all sites, or well, across the analysis of all sites, we detected a lower yield, uh, and it equated to a couple tonne. Um, which is, has, um, although it doesn't really necessarily have an impact on growers, it has an impact on the mill and, as kind of said, the cost. 
we can apply DMPP treated urea 20% less, uh, maintain yield, uh, profitability, and also improve annual yield. We can do the same with a controlled release blend with urea. Uh, the only problem with the controlled release fertilizers is that there are, there are polymers. And I did note that um, 12 months after putting down polymers, you can go back again and find those polymers empty. Still sitting on the soil, on the sitting on the soil surface. So polymers are an issue, um, and I think the um, the MDP or the MTEC is probably a better long term product to utilise. Uh, yes, I'm coming into this project coming towards the tail end of looking at it fresh eyes, and um, when I see this experimental CRF uh, with a high percentage of the EES included, it, it just shows to me that you need to get the proportion right um, for that cost balance to be right so that it can actually be more profitable. Um, and I guess there's that evidence that EES are more effective when high condition directs experience, um, both from a production point of view and from an economic point of view as well. So for growers, they can, um, you know, probably a good starting point if you just, if growers want to give it a go, I'm sort of recommending that they could, you know, try it late in the season. Um, but saying that, there's also no reason why a grower just couldn't, um, you know, implement that as a standard practice at any time of year. We couldn't detect any sort of negative outcomes. So I uh, just want to acknowledge the Australian and Queensland government, uh, pan growers, uh, all the growers and the contractors who participate in the trials. Um, there's a lot of researchers and technicians, the biometricians, and the productivity services, and also the suppliers of the products. And that's it. And again, I think the team's to be congratulated. I can't take any credit for all this, but Julian and these partners and Matthew Thompson and, and the work that they've done um, it, it really is a massive undertaking. This 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 amount of sites, this in depth analysis, and I guess again, being ahead of the curve in terms of doing this research, uh, getting the ball rolling on it at a time now when we've got high vert costs and people are looking for different options. Um, so it's, I think we owe these guys a round of applause. Right?